Okay. Um, all right. Can everybody see what I'm seeing here? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So today we're going to talk about pastiche um, and appropriation. Um, and this is where I get to really nerd out because it really does fall under the scope of what my area of expertise is, which is appropriation. And we'll talk about both of those words as we move forward. But a pastiche is just simply, um, it's a hodgepodge, right? It's a bunch of different things thrown together to make something new, okay? And the key word there is to make something new. So this primarily links in with the notion of appropriation. And an appropriation is actually a relatively new concept, um, really kind of started in the 20th, in the late 20th century. So we'll read this really quick and it'll be the last slide I read. Um, in the visual arts, to appropriate means to adopt, borrow, or recycle, or sample aspects um, of man-made visual culture. It means to just take, right? If you think of hip hop and how hip hop samples and pulls hooks and lines from other musical um, uh, uh, examples, it, it ultimately is appropriation. So the strategies might include re-envisioning something, re-evaluating something, ver variation, version, your interpretation, your imitation, um, your approximation. So this one sounds like a little bit of a wrap. Uh, all of those things, right? In order to create something new, okay? Karaoke is a word in there that really did, kind of falls under the, the umbrella of appropriation. It also refers to the use of borrowed elements in the creation of a new work, as in the artist uses appropriation. So that's going to be the most um, uh, pinpointed thing that we utilize here. And it refers to the new work itself, as in this is a piece of appropriation art. And I'm going to show you only appropriation art today. So art practices that involve the appropriation of ideas, symbols, artifacts, images, sounds, objects, forms, or styles from other cultures. You can appropriate from art history. You can also appropriate from popular culture or other aspects of man-made visual and non-visual culture. So um, inherent in the process of appropriation is the fact that a new work recontextualizes whatever it borrows from to create the new work, okay? And I'll, I'll kind of dismantle that and really unpack that for you guys before we leave. In most cases, the original thing remains accessible as the original without change. Okay. One of the first works of appropriation art was actually this piece here. It's a collage done by Richard Hamilton. And it's actually the reason in the, the, the piece that started the word pop art. So the whole movement of pop art, like Andy Warhol pop art, started with this particular piece because of that sucker right in the middle of this collage. And yes, that is the title. Just what is that makes today's so home so different, so appealing? And it was done in 1956. And it's a collage, right? And it's a collage that's been cut up from a variety of different sources, from comics, from interior design magazines, from muscle mags, from girly pinup magazines, like from pornography. And it was all combined together to make something new. You all see that. So we can understand the source, but in the fact that it is a mixture of things, the context and the meaning of the artwork changes. So we have the moon as the ceiling there. So we have a, a reference to the, uh, the space race. We have this reference to American kind of like superficiality in its obsession with the body and sexuality. And the, this kind of, Oh, I, immersion into the middle class, right? Um, the, the, the wasp values, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant values of obtaining a home and owning it and having all of the things that are up to date technologically in that home that keep you up with the Joneses. Some other artists that are appropriation artists that you probably don't think about a lot are um, the, the artists that came directly before the pop artists, which are the abstract expressionists. And of course, the best known abstract expressionist is actually Jackson Pollock, okay? And some, some people that he frequented, uh, he was friendly with, who were sort of his artistic accomplices, ran in the same circles, are Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. And this, at the height of New York City's um, ABEX movement, really was the rebirth or the birth 
of the convention of pulling works from popular culture and renewing them and reassembling them through pastiche. You see that Robert Rauschenberg is pulling images from JFK. He's using silkscreen and then painting on top of it. And Jasper Johns is actually appropriating things from newspapers as well as actual objects themselves. So we see a stuffed crow there and then this bag of, I don't know, sand that is actually suggestive of um, some sort of testicular form. Um, he, he did a lot in dealing with masculinity and fragile masculinity. Um, Later on in the 1970s and 80s, we have a guy named Sigmar Polka, who's making work that actually looks like it's made today, like in 2020. But this was done way back when in the 60s. And he would use things like, uh, uh, he would appropriate from things like um, children's books. See, we, hear, we see a children's book illustration here in the center. And then he's using kind of spray paint and just more commercially sourced uh, materials, which was a no-no before them. And so it becomes very popular and it really does catch on because it's very familiar to the American consciousness. Here we see a later work of his uh, using comic book imagery. And then of course the language of the abstract expressionist, which is this sort of very painterly expressive um, approach here to the surface. I'm gonna show you a bunch of artists today and kind of talk about their process to give you some ideas of what, what the direction you might wanna go with this next assignment. This is a contemporary living artist named Nicole Wormers. And this is from a series of collages that she did that's actually from gems, gem encyclopedias, where she's reorganizing them, cutting them up to create what appears to be a non-objective collage. And then Ian Dawson is doing much the same thing. He's doing uh, collages as well, but his source imagery often comes from not only encyclopedias, but also like tattoo flash magazines um, that showcase the body and the sort of art that's depicted on uh, inked bodies. Ludovica Gioschia, and that's my best pronunciation of that, is using both painting and collage. So what these are are actual photographs where painted surfaces on paper are then cut out and then used to obscure the portrait themselves. So become kind of irritating to look at. They kind of um, obscure the identity of the subject and then they defeat the purpose of the original intentions of por portraiture, which is to see the person and their physiognomy, their likeness. Here we have a, a, another piece done by the exact same artist who's doing installation work utilizing decorative papers or wallpapers. And so the collage is sort of a half-hearted attempt at, and they're not half-hearted, they're very sort of interesting uh, visually, but it's a sort of half-hearted assemblage of these different textures and patterns in order to create a whole visual field that ultimately is about decay. Um, they're bright and they're poppy, but this lining sort of falls down and creates a sort of um, uh, a, a, a disjunctive uh, emotional space of a lack of stability, right? It looks sort of thrown together. Um, here's another interior done by the same artist in, um, in, in an installation space. So you're meant to walk in them and sort of just look around. And then the same artist doing these sort of movable walls. Um, and they're almost like packages but they're also sort of indicative of like, you know, if you've ever been to Italy, and this is an Italian artist, and you walk down the streets in, a, in Rome, you're gonna see poster after poster after poster after poster that has been wheat pasted over another one and another one and another one, and they begin to fall down and decay over time as it rains. And so these sort of remind me of, of what you'd see in the, in the, in the, you know, in the alleys of, of Rome. One of my favorite artists is a painter and sculptor by the name of Wengechi Mutu. And she's actually an expat. She's an African artist um, who did experience um, genocide um, and the images and life of being embedded in uh, African strife um, in, um, while she was living in Africa. She's now in America. And what she does in her work is she creates these kind of monstrous bodies through her use of watercolor and collage and airbrush in order to make a new woman, a kind of Frankenstein woman. And what she pulls from really does yield her content because what she's pulling from is high-end fashion magazine, women's magazines like W and Vogue, which primarily depict white thin bodies. 
She's an African artist, though, but she's, so she's also pulling from black exploitation pornography. And that means pornography that exploits the black body um, of women. And so things that focus on, um, you know, the buns and the breasts of, and the lips of black women um, that have been historically fetishized. And so she pairs them both together. And so she'll pull in really jarring images that you discover as you see the whole. Um, but they're also very violent. Um, and they're very violent, obviously, because of her background, but also the commentary that she wants to make about uh, the implicit violence that has been imposed on women's bodies in popular culture. David Saleh is sort of the poster boy of postmodernism. He was really at his height in the 80s, and he's still making work today. And he does these sort of like collage pastiches that are actually done much in the same way I make paintings, which is done primarily in Photoshop first and then painted. And so you oftentimes see the filter that he uses in Photoshop, um, but also just sort of the sourcing and the language that is utilized in that program. And then he makes them much, much larger and he paints them. So they're all exclusively paintings. Jean-Michel Basquiat, one of my all-time favorite painters as well. He's since passed. He died uh, in about 1990 from a heroin overdose. Um, and he was sort of a bad boy in the art world. He, had a, he skyrocketed to fame by creating images like this, which really did pull from not only street art and graffiti. He was a graffiti artist initially. Um, but he did go to art school. He was trained. And so he pulled also from art history and African uh, tribal art as well. And so the, the two things really did combine in order to create a unique voice that is very um, primal. And he, he also did a collaboration. He was uh, friends with Andy Warhol. He lived in New York City. And he was friends with Andy Warhol. And they did a whole exhibition together where... Um, Andy Warhol would start out the images making these huge um, silkscreen um, paintings and then Basquiat would get his hands on them and he would destroy them. And they'd go back and forth and create these um, collaborative images, which at its heart is essentially pastiche. A contemporary artist who's living today is Andre Butzer. These are sort of stream of consciousness, right? He sort of makes them up and he probably has sketchbooks full and full and full of doodles. But these doodles are highly informed by cartoons, as you see, so in memes and those little icons, emoticons. Um, so he's making this work today. So while it's not direct appropriation, it's heavily influenced by the language of emoticon art, emoji art, and, and, and uh, cartoons. John Yoyogi Fortes makes enormous paintings that really do yield complete pastiches. They are layered again and again and again. He sands into them in order to create surfaces like this, uh, but he also paints very heavily, and then he paints, you know, hard-edged. Um, and all of this is painted. None of this is actually... So that Jesus back there, that's actually painted. That's not um, glued on there with collage. So all of this is just, um, you know, really an expression of his, his mastery of technique. Here's another piece of his. This particular piece, if you YouTube him, you can see the making of this piece and how much labor actually goes into the back and forth and this sort of dance of adding and subtracting and adding and subtracting and adding. Hung Lu actually died a couple of months ago over the summer, sadly, very young. She was in her 60s. Um, she was an artist who lived in the Bay Area in California, and she appropriated images from primarily the 19th century of Chinese women. You see, she has a Chinese name. She's a Chinese uh, descendant. Um, uh, I believe she might be from China. Maybe she might be American. I don't know. Um, born in America. But she would pull from all of these images, appropriate these images, and then transform them through uh, this sort of layering and stacking of um, decorative motifs, such as you see here, florals, etc. And a lot of her images are pulling from really difficult images of like the bound feet women of China during the 18th and 19th centuries, which of course, you know, inhibited their, com completely inhibited their ability to walk, but ultimately was a fetishistic exploration of um, women's uh, bodies. Shazia Sikander is a Pakistani artist who I adore. There's an Art 21 that you should all watch of hers. I adore her. She does, she's a watercolor miniaturist and she works in the style of a Persian miniature painter. And Persian miniatures have been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. 
And she was actually trained to do Persian miniatures. So with a tiny little brush and tempera paint and in layers. And so she creates really, really heavily invested paintings that pull from her entire life, but also this use of the Persian miniature. So they do look like pages of, um, of, of, of these little iconographic paintings. But you'll also see things like, oh, a cowboy boot, because when she was painting this, she was living in Dallas in a residency in Houston. So you'll see this sort of like pastiche of the, the the variety and multitudes of not only influences, but the actual emblems of her life that become a kind of visual diary. Fred Tomaselli wants to make paintings. Uh, they're not really, you can call them paintings. They're more like collages, but giant paintings uh, about his experience with psychedelic drugs. Um, all of these images are basically cut out collages that have been layered with resin. And what is resin? Resin is when you go into a bar and you touch the countertop on the bar and it's got that thin layer of plastic that looks like it was poured, that is resin. And so what he does is he glues down all these layers and then he pours a layer of resin and then he does another layer and then he pours another layer of resin and then he does another layer of collage and then another layer of resin. So they, you begin to look into them and they reflect and refract like jewels. And all of them are cut from the pages of magazines and books. Here is a, a large uh, bird head that he did. I think I have a close up. But if you look closely, these are all eyes. Sometimes he'll put pills. These are pills. Some of it is painted. And we're getting closer to what this collage is. And then I believe I have one more close-up of this. Oh, no, I don't. So you get to you get an idea about how intensely committed they are. And what his works are essentially about is this altered state of reality that he experienced while he was on psychedelia. Um, he's pulling from the works of Hieronymus Bosch, who was actually a Renaissance, Northern Renaissance painter um, in the sort of Germany region, who made these really crazy images of hell um, and suffering and used these kind of monstrous figures in order to, to be an act as stand-ins of sin. And so his images really do pull from this sort of strange surrealist movement of um, his work, Bosch's work. Beatrice Milhazes is a, uh, a Brazilian artist. She is really influenced by nature, but also she's pulling exclusively from 1970s interior design and textile design. And the, her process is very interesting because what she actually does is she takes just plastic, like clear plastic, and paints acrylic onto it. And when you paint acrylic onto plastic, you can actually peel it off like a sticker. And when you peel it off, the other side where that acrylic went onto doesn't have a single brush mark on it because it adhered to plastic. And so what she does is she just glues it on top of these giant panels in order to create these sort of explosions of wallpaper design, uh, textile design, um, and just graphic design from the 1970s. So here's another example of her, of her work. Along the same lines is a guy named Franz Ackermann, who's a painter, ultimately pulling from everything. But stylistically, he's really making them his by simply painting them in this sort of flat way. So he's pulling from graphic design. He's pulling from architecture magazines. He's pulling from um, comics as well. And here we have an installation of his work. So here we have an example of one of his paintings with this sort of sculptural intervention of the space itself, which, yes, do sell very well. Another one of his pieces. So you see, like, this landscape back here you know, some sort of fjord, and then this sort of explosion of architectural spaces. So it really is a pastiche of pulling from a variety of different images that he might take, that he might um, make himself, and that he might steal. Albert Olin actually paints on um, big advertisements, and he completely obscures them. Here's another one of his examples. You see some sort of advertising elements down here. Neo Rausch is a painter, all of their, it's exclusively paint, but he's pulling, pulling from the propaganda images of uh, the um, Eastern Germany. Western Germany? I think it was Western Germany. Uh, I'm thinking of communist Germany when, German, when one side of Germany was communist. And he's pulling uh, 
the style of his paintings from the posters that would have been up at, and acting as political propaganda. But what he's doing is he's changing the narrative of them completely because he's not because Germany is no longer communist, uh, or at least that side of Germany is no longer communist. Uh, they're, they're remarkable paintings. They really are painted very uh, brutally, beautifully, and they're strangely drawn. Um, so, I mean, highly recommend seeing one of his shows if you ever get a chance. I think there's a Nao Rao show up in New York right now. And he, so what he's pulling from is this sort of convention of these communist propaganda posters that one would see everywhere. And they, they're still up in, and China really still uses them, um, even though, you know, strictly China isn't communist, but it really is. Um, and uh, we see uh, an artist who has reappropriated Stalin with George W. Bush in order to create what looks like a propaganda poster. And the propaganda posters are interesting because they're really beautifully done. They're all painted. Um, they're oil paintings, most of them. And they oftentimes feature like, look at how happy our people are. They're looking into the distance. They're holding up their red book of rules, uh, citing their commitment to the state, not the government, the state. And they're all equal and they're all striving towards the same unified goal, right? It very much is about um, supporting an ideology that might necessarily be accurate, um, but ultimately still, still is influential today. Tal R is a painter and collage artist. These are all collaged and then painted. So it's really ultimately not necessarily about the tininess of the, the images. You really would discover that if you get close to them. And then the end all say all of appropriation artists is the man named Jeff Koons, who's probably one of the richest, he is one of the richest contemporary artists working today. This is entirely painted. He has a whole studio of people that help him assemble these as well as paint them. Um, most of his paintings he's never even touched. He's never mixed a single color in them and ever applied a brush to the canvas. Um, but you see here that this is a, a just pulled from all sorts of sources. Superman, um, we have pornography in here, we have um, comics in here, we have children's illustrations in here, we have all kinds of things in here that are painted, combined together and smushed in order to make a melange or a mixture or a pastiche of appropriated subject matter. And while doing that, the content changes. And the content changes to become essentially about the schizophrenic um, influence of simply the American psyche. Sometimes the American psyche in his work, I think would read as incredibly vacuous and empty. Um, and sometimes it's about childhood and sometimes it's about a celebration of patriotism, but it's also about the complication of all of those things. Um, so the, he really is probably the closest to what we're going to be pulling from, from this assignment. And so I'll end there. Are there questions before I show you the assignment?